on World News Tonight. Eviction disputes, clashes over land continues in the Holy Land. Rising cases, COVID cases continue to rise rapidly in the Asian continent. Families reunite. Travelers from the EU and US continue to arrive in the UK. Pop cake drive. Bake sales around Australia raises funds for a good cause. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. A very good evening and thank you for joining with us on World News Tonight. Today we begin today's coverage with the ongoing hellfire in Turkey. Locals in the affected areas were reported to be helping firefighters in their ongoing battle against the blazing inferno that is laying waste all across Turkey for the past few days. These locals were seen extinguishing the fires with buckets of water as a last-ditch attempt to save their properties. With flames licking at their doorsteps, Locals in the Turkish resort town of Marmaris have stepped in to take matters into their own hands. Walking up and down the hills ferrying water, the locals are angry that there have not been enough helicopters and planes used to contain the fires burning since Wednesday. The Turkish government faced fresh criticism of its handling of the disaster on Monday. Firefighters have taken control of 125 of the 132 fires, with 16 planes and 51 helicopters tackling them from the air in an operation also involving some 850 firefighting vehicles and more than 5,000 personnel, according to the forestry minister. Their work was being hindered, though, as temperatures soared above 40 degrees Celsius, paired with strong winds and very low humidity of around 8%. Residents like Gulhan have now found themselves in the line of fire. The EU said it had helped mobilise three firefighting planes on Sunday one from Croatia and two from Spain, after Turkey activated a disaster response scheme to request help from other European countries. President Erdogan's communications director rejected criticism of the government's handling of the situation. He slammed a social media campaign calling for foreign help for Turkey, describing most information about the fires on the platform as fake news. As the southern European nation battles hundreds of wildfires, officials warn that the country is facing its worst heat wave for 30 years. For more on this, let's cross over to other than a world news special correspondent, Prashani Rodrigo, who joins us now from Helsinki in Finland. Prashani? Yes, Shanali. Temperatures soared across Greece as the worst heat wave in decades pushed the power system to its limits and Greeks and tourists headed to fountains and beaches to cool down. With the weather service forecasting temperatures in the capital as high as 44 Celsius this week, energy authorities have warned that power demand will skyrocket, testing the capacity of an electricity grid already burdened by more than 3 million holiday makers during the summer tourist season. The Acropolis Greece's most visited archaeological site was shut down before noon to protect visitors from the heat as sweaty tourists made their way down from the marble steps. Authorities advised people to limit power usage at peak times in the afternoon and evening to prevent the electricity system collapsing with the households and businesses turning up air conditioners to seek relief from the brutal heat. Professors of climate science said the heat wave in Southeast Europe is not at all unexpected and very likely enhanced due to human induced climate change. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. And that was other than a World News Special Correspondent Prashani Rodrigo reporting from Helsinki in Finland. Afghanistan's President Ashraf Ghani blamed the country's deteriorating security on Washington, deciding abruptly to withdraw its troops. 
Flights out of Kandahar were suspended for a time on Sunday after two rockets hit the runway before dawn. The facility is vital to maintaining the logistics and air support needed to keep the Taliban from overrunning the city, their former stronghold. Insurgents have been blamed for a mortar attack that killed several people, including children, elsewhere in Kandahar province on Sunday. The latest violence comes as the Taliban inches closer to overwhelming at least two other provincial capitals. Fighting between the Taliban and government forces has been escalating as US and NATO troops complete their withdrawal from the country. Insurgents have seized large tracts of land and captured key border crossings. The Ministry of Defence says hundreds of commandos were sent to the western city of Herat following another day of clashes. Afghan authorities have repeatedly dismissed the Taliban's steady gains in recent months, saying they lack strategic value. But the army has largely failed to reverse the insurgents' momentum. Capturing any major urban centre would further fuel concerns that the government is incapable of resisting the Taliban's advances. Israel's Supreme Court delayed a decision in the case of Palestinian families facing expulsion by Israeli settlers in annexed East Jerusalem, an issue that exploded into an armed conflict in May. It's a hotly anticipated ruling which has now been pushed back. Israel's Supreme Court has postponed its decision on a group of Palestinians facing eviction from East Jerusalem's Flashpoint Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood. Both sides claim ownership to the land. Judges hoped to find a solution by getting the Palestinians to recognize Israeli ownership in exchange for protected tenant status, an unacceptable offer for the families. According to Israeli law, if Jews can prove their family lived in East Jerusalem before the 1948 Arab-Israeli war, they become owners of the land. Last October, a court therefore ruled in favor of the Israeli settlers. But the Palestinians hold a document which says Jordan, which built the houses, planned on ceding them to the Palestinians before the War of 1967, which saw Jordan lose control of the territory to Israel. The case has become symbolic of larger divisions and helped stoke the fighting that broke out in May, in which the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound, Islam's third holiest site, was stormed by Israeli troops. Riots then broke out in several cities in Israel, which escalated to an 11-day war between Israel and Hamas in the Gaza Strip. French Interior Minister Gerard Darmanin has unveiled a series of new measures aimed at combating domestic violence, with numbers of femicide at an uptick since 2020. The latest victim of femicide in France is a 38-year-old mother of two. On Friday, July 30th, a woman was killed by her partner in Abim. This is the 69th femicide since the start of the year. Emmanuel Macron, this is urgent. Do something. Domestic violence is now the main reason for police intervention in France, with more than 400,000 cases per year. Reports of abuse jumped by more than 30 percent when the country first went into lockdown in 2020. And although the number of deaths was lower than the previous year, the figure still remains far too high. This, according to the French interior minister, Gérald Darmanin, who unveiled a fresh set of measures that aim to clamp down on the violence. The government will create task forces specializing in the fight against domestic abuse in each department. Abuse cases will also be reported to the prosecutor to turn each finding into a formal complaint or a report. By the end of August, an officer will be appointed to each police station and gendarmerie brigade to ensure the follow-up of the complaint files. France already has one of the highest rates of domestic violence in Europe. According to official figures, one woman is killed by a partner or former partner every three days. The latest on the COVID crisis right after this break, you're watching World News. Welcome back. Now looking at the COVID situation in Asia. China is facing a fresh COVID-19 outbreak with infections popping up across the country. The Delta variant is now dominant across Indonesia, while Thailand is extending lockdowns to contain the virus. China is currently on alert amid what seems like the country's worst COVID-19 outbreak this year. Fueled with the spread of the highly transmissible Delta variant, at least eight provinces reported infections on Monday. 
The country's latest outbreak started last month in Nanjing, Jiangsu province, after airport cleaning staff were found to have the Delta variant. The National Health Commission on Monday reported 55 locally transmitted cases. 40 of them were from Jiangsu province, and the remaining 15 were from various regions, including Hunan, Hubei, and Beijing. Although the daily figure is relatively lower than other countries, the Global Times on Sunday reported that the recent surge is the most serious one since the initial outbreak in Wuhan. The Delta variant is now almost completely dominant in Indonesia. According to the Indonesian Health Ministry on Sunday, 86 percent of infections from 24 provinces were found to be the Delta variant. The ministry added that the mutated strain has spread almost evenly throughout the country. Other Southeast Asian countries are also grappling with surging infections and are taking stronger measures to curb the spread. Thailand has decided to extend its lockdown for 13 provinces for another two weeks starting Tuesday. And an additional 16 provinces have also been added to the list. Under Thailand's lockdown, restaurants will only allow deliveries and religious, cultural and sports facilities will close. Aside from Thailand, Vietnam is also facing a rapid spread of infections that has led to movement restrictions in around one-third of the country. We have other than a world special correspondent, Maika De Silva from Hanoi in Vietnam. For more, Maika. Yes, Shanali. Vietnam extended strict curbs on movement in its business hub Ho Chi Minh City and another 18 cities and provinces throughout its south for another two weeks to help combat it's the worst COVID-19 outbreak. After successfully containing the virus for much of the pandemic, Vietnam is facing a rapid spread of infections that has led to movement restrictions in around one third of the country. It has registered a total of 145,000 cases and 1,600 deaths, 85% of which were recorded over the past month. Ho Chi Minh City is currently Vietnam's epicenter, accounting for 64% of the country's total infections. In addition, the capital Hanoi in the north, where a lockdown order will expire next weekend, authorities were considering the extension of current restrictions. Vietnam has a population of 98 million and has so far administrated over 5.9 million doses of COVID-19 vaccine, but only around 589,000 people have been fully inoculated. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent Maika De Silva reporting from Hanoi in Vietnam. Germany's health minister said in a statement that the country will start to offer a booster shot to vulnerable individuals such as pensioners and people with weak immune systems. Let's cross over to other than a World News Special Correspondent Inuka Ponzo, who joins us now from Cleve in Germany. Inuka? Yes, Shanali. The vaccinations will be done using mRNA vaccines from Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna, regardless of what was used previously. They also agreed to make vaccinations available to all children aged 12 to 17. The decisions reflect concerns in Germany that the Delta variant could force the country back into restrictions and lockdowns as Europe's largest economy nears a general election. Germany's 16 states, which manage their own health affairs, are eager to vaccinate more people to avoid a fourth wave of the coronavirus. Just over 52% of the population has been fully vaccinated, and about 62% have received at least one shot. Vaccinating children between 12 and 17 is voluntary, as for the rest of the population, and will be done only after parental consent and a medical checkup that rules out serious health risks. About 10% of the 4.5 million children in this age group have been fully vaccinated. Back to you, Shanali. Thank you. And that was other than in a World News Special Correspondent Inuka Ponzo reporting from Cleve in Germany. Emotional reunions take place as double job travelers from EU and the US arrive at airports all around the UK. After quarantine rule is scrapped, EU and US citizens can travel to the UK without facing self-isolation after rule change came into effect. Families and friends were overjoyed at London's Heathrow Airport on Monday. A travel rule change meant many could reunite after 18 months of separation without the need to quarantine. Sue Blake was waiting for her family from New York. 
it means the world, especially as an eight-year-old child who hasn't seen his grandparents for a, a couple of years. It's a big chunk of his life and I'm so thrilled for him that he can come here. Watching the emotional scenes in the arrivals hall, Heathrow's boss urged Britain to remove barriers to travel. Britain has scrapped quarantine for fully vaccinated arrivals from the EU and the United States, although France is excluded from the relaxation. Airline bosses have been urging the UK to soften its rules as the sector battles to get back up and running. But on Monday, there was another potential headache for the industry. The Times newspaper reported that the government is planning to warn holidaymakers against visiting Spain. It's worried about rising cases in Britain's most popular holiday destination. We have some good news for you. South Korea is working in many areas to make its economy more eco-friendly. One technology that could make a big difference is a kind of artificial photosynthesis. Researchers have developed a device that uses sunlight to change carbon dioxide from air into another chemical compounds with a variety of uses. Researchers are conducting the first outdoor tests of their solar energy device. The gas particles forming inside the tube are created by electricity. Using this electricity, the device creates artificial photosynthesis. But as opposed to trees, which convert carbon dioxide and water into oxygen and carbohydrates, this device creates useful chemical substances. Another breakthrough is that the efficiency of the device's carbon dioxide conversion rate has never been this high. What enables the device to show such a high conversion rate of useful energy is a catalyst made of carbon crystals. It is coated with layers of tungsten and silver, and thanks to this special coating, the catalyst's carbon monoxide production rate has spiked over 60 percent. Researchers also explained that the coating helps boost the catalyst's durability as it kept the carbon slate operational for 100 hours. But most importantly, the team feels confident that it now has a system that is mechanically compatible with the catalyst. Industry insiders believe that once the latest technology is successfully commercialized, it will help convert carbon dioxide from steel factories and petrochemical refineries into useful chemical substances, thus reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Welcome back, and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. A sharp showdown in factory activity growth in China raised new fears over a global recovery, sending oil prices lower. There were similar drops in other Asian exporters, including Vietnam, Malaysia and Indonesia. The UN had added world's oldest mummification technique, which has developed by the Chinchiro culture, located in present-day Chile in UNESCO's World Heritage List. Frenchman Esteban Ocon raced to his maiden Formula One win in a chaotic Hungary during Grand Prix after Sebastian Vettel, who came second, was disqualified after his Aston Martin was found not to have enough fuel to provide the mandatory post-race sample. Portuguese President Marcelo Rebelo de Sousa met with his Brazilian counterpart Jair Bolsonaro at the Planalto Presidential Palace in Brazil. Mexican authorities announced a contest to develop a project that will preserve the Pyramid of the Feathered Serpent. The project's objective is to develop a roof structure that will guarantee the pyramid's conservation and will stabilize the monument. And finally tonight, an Australian organization has come up with a delicious way to raise money to help thousands of animals across the continent. Whether you are whipping up donuts, brownies or traditional cupcakes, the funds raised at the Cupcake Day event help rescue, rehabilitated and rehome animals in need all over the country. Animals and cakes, there's no greater recipe. Eggs and flour and butter and stuff, a little bit of sugar butter. It's time for the RSPCA Cupcake Day, a chance to help all creatures, great and small. <coughs> With COVID hitting hard its usual fundraising efforts, the Animal Welfare Organisation hopes to raise $530,000 from Cupcake Day to help 112,000 animals across Australia. That goes towards caring for them, providing veterinary care and helping them into their rehabilitation and in their future loving permanent homes. And what better way to do that than to get involved? Bakehouse Ferguson Player is an RSPCA partner. It's making pup cakes, a dollar from each one sold, helping to raise much needed funds. 
And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.